Take your hymn books and we'll sing to page 409. We're going to uh, up tempo a little bit here after we've prayed and think about the importance of sending missionaries and the importance of us holding the fort on the home front and sending others around. So stand as we sing all four verses, 409. Oh, my comrades, say the signal waving in the sky. Reinforcements now appearing, victory is nigh. Hold the fort, for I am coming, Jesus signal still, wave the answer. that part you'll notice some people are waving their bible if you want to do that you can join in on the second verse here we go see the mighty host advancing satan leading on mighty men around us falling courage almost gone hold the fort for the last verse. Fierce and long the battle rages, but our help is near. Onward comes our great commander. Cheer, my comrades, cheer. Hold the fort, for I am coming. Jesus, signal still. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and we're going to continue from where we left off the last time I was here, which was Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 here. And we'll pick up in verse... Verse 26 here. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem to worship was returning, sitting in his chariot, reading Elias the prophet. So here is uh, Philip, and earlier in the chapter here, uh, Philip had gone up, and he had uh, gone up into Samaria, gone north, and had seen the, uh, the, uh, the Lord do a great work there, saw many people come to know Christ, and started baptizing them. And one of the folks there that uh, came to be baptized was uh, Simon there, and uh, and he, well, Simon, uh, he really didn't get all on board. He was just there trying to maintain his influence, maintain his power. And well, of course, when Peter and the apostles at Jerusalem heard that now the Samaritans had received the word of God and that they came up and they uh, uh, laid hands on them, they received the Holy Ghost. That was common practice during that time. It is not today. We don't, you don't need laying on of hands to receive the Holy Ghost today. You just need to trust the Lord as your Savior, and he gives you the Holy Ghost then. So uh, move, So Peter and John came uh, up there, and they uh, saw what was going on. They received the Holy Ghost. They were baptized. And uh, Simon decides, hey, you know, I can see that. You know, with you guys, you lay hands on, and you, that they receive the, whole, the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Simon tries to buy this with money, and uh, Paul has some strong words for him about that. Uh, so right along the lines of uh, there in verse 22 of Acts chapter 8, Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God for, 
it perhaps the thought of thy heart may be forgiven. I perceive thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So those are some of the words there that Peter has for him uh, as I'm trying to go through this uh, backstory, the first part of this chapter quickly. There, that's, uh, that's what he goes there. And then there in verse 25 says, And they, when they testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. This was Peter and John. They had returned to Jerusalem uh, earlier. And then we see the very next verse that the Lord tells Philip to go past Jerusalem down to the way that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. Hey, guys, you can throw that map up there. Uh, so you can see there, uh, it may be hard to see, but... The orange line there, that is the line there from Samaria to Jerusalem. And the green line coming a little further south is the one of the plausible roads that would have gone from Jerusalem to uh, Gaza there where, uh, where Philip was told to go. And so Philip uh, could have offered a number of excuses. Uh, we see what we had read earlier that in verse 27, that this Ethiopian eunuch, he had actually come to Jerusalem. There was a, a church there at Jerusalem that, uh, that was growing, that was preaching the word. The apostles, a, n- a number of the apostles were still there, the faithful, uh, those who were faithful with them. Uh, yet through that, though, this, uh, this eunuch, he, uh, he didn't uh, trust Christ as a savior. He didn't uh, connect with that church that was there. And so we see that Philip is actually called to go to leave Samaria where God was doing a great work and God was moving there and yet God told him, you need to go south of Jerusalem, which in Philip he could have said, you know, that's a, that's a long ways and, you know, the Lord, there, certainly there's other people you could send, could have been uh, like a Moses, you know, uh, he, uh, Lord, I can't speak well. I want to send, send you? Know, want to bring deliverance by him whom you choose? And the Lord saying, "I'm trying to choose you. You just giving me excuses." And Philip, uh, we could it's not recorded that he did that, but he could have. I mean, there were other men that could have uh, easily have gone that way, and yet we see that Philip uh, obeyed right away. Uh, there in verse 26 says, "And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, go towards the south." unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert, in verse 27, and he arose and went. He left immediately. And that's important to note because the Bible does tell us in uh, 1 Samuel uh, 15 that obedience is what the Lord wants. He says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than to the fat of rams. This was uh, Samuel telling Saul this. Uh, in God values our obedience, and this wasn't. Uh, this isn't just the, the only case. We also see this um, in uh, in Genesis that Abraham he believed God and was counted unto him for righteousness. There, when he was called to leave Ur of the Chaldeas, he didn't stay and he didn't go. Well, you know, Lord, I don't know. You know where are you going to send me? Where am I going to go? But he he left out. He left immediately and had to be led by the Lord. Uh, same thing when he went to, uh, to Mount Moriah in obedience to, to what God had told him about uh, sacrificing his only son to him. And he says, all right, I'm, I'm going to get up and we're going to go, and the Lord will tell me when I get there. And uh, so that's he, we see his obedience uh, there as well. And Philip here, he obeyed. He didn't raise any questions, didn't go, ah, you know, the, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know how. I don't know where I'm going. And you go. You could say, you know, Lord, there's no reason to be out there. There's nobody out there. It's just, you know, how, what are you trying to to do here? And uh, and he just obeyed instead of making excuses. And God really, uh, he expects us to do the same thing. He says in John fourteen fifteen, he says, if you love me. Keep my commandments. We're, we are to obey God. We are to keep his commandments. This is a demonstration of our love to him, is our obedience to him. 
And so just as that is our demonstration to God that we love him, that we obey him, so Philip uh, here demonstrates his love for God and for the Lord Jesus by obeying and going out to where a place where it would not, humanly speaking, make much sense. Well, why am I leaving what you're doing here? Why am I leaving this revival to go out to the desert? And yet God had a plan for him there. And we see the plan uh, there in verse uh, 27 there. Uh, we learn of a man, he says, and went and behold a man in Ethi of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship and was returning, sitting in his chariot, read, he, he read Elias the prophet. And so he, here, Philip, he goes out, he's in this desert, could have made excuses about, ah, you know, it's, it's really inconvenient. There's other people that are closer. Well, why don't you send one of them? But he obeyed right away. And we're going to see uh, here, he's going to find out why. And we see that the eunuch had a need. Uh, and was Philip, he got out there. Uh, verse 29 says, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. So apparently there may have been multiple chariots, there may have been other folks there, but God pointed out, I want you to go to that one. Go see that one. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, I'm really thankful that God sees each individual and doesn't run the gospel and the kingdom of God like we might run a business today. Boy, you know, it would be really easy to to you know, go out and to put a business where, boy, everybody's there and everyone's moving around, but yet God said, I don't want you to focus all on that. I just want you to focus on obeying me. And I'm going to send you to this one. Working with the post office, it's often, we often talk about, oh, you know, they want to privatize the post office and this, that, and the other. Oh, yeah, people would love to buy the places that are in the cities, but they don't want to buy all the rural offices that you know service the town of uh, of 1,500 or 500. You know they don't want to, they don't want the small towns where it's not profitable for them. And yet God doesn't run the gospel like that. God's not just going. Well, you know there's a big gathering of people over here. Let's send the gospel to them. Oh, there's a big gathering of people over here. We'll send the gospel to them. Oh, there's someone on the road there. Well, you know, I'll send someone when I have time, when, 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 someone's, when I feel someone's available. But God cares just for that one, just as much as he does for the multitude. God wants us to be faithful to go tell everyone. God wants us to be faithful to witness to crowds, whether large or small. So we see that the eunuch, he had a need, and Philip's... Uh, is to hear, he's to go, and he's to draw near. And he asked him the question. Philip ran hither and heard him read the prophet Elias and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Kind of a, a fair question. Well, yeah, I hear you're reading. Apparently, he, uh, the Ethiopian would have been reading out loud in order for Philip to hear this. He would the uh, and he says, I, do, do, you, do you know what you're reading? And which uh, the man confesses that? No. He says, how can I except some man should guide me? And we see that the Ethiopian, he had a need to be guided. He had a need to learn these things, to have someone who knew them direct them and teach them. And we see this in uh, Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 14. It says, how then shall they call upon him whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? There has to be someone who has to go and has to physically tell them, this is what the word of God is. Let me help you. Let me guide you to what God is saying. And so here the man is asking, uh, he says, how can I? I need someone to help me. I need someone to guide me. So, and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him in the chariot there. 
And so he began there at the same place in Elias. Uh, the Bible tells in verse 32, it says, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb dumb before his shears, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Uh, then the eunuch, he asked a question. Here it says, Then the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet? Of himself or of some other man? So he had the question, you know, hey, is he talking about himself or is he talking about someone else? Now we know that there he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Philip's going to uh, show him that there in verse 35. It says, Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Uh, this the wording of it is very much like uh, on the road to Emmaus, how they, how they were going and they two disciples there said, hey, we're talking about the things that had happened and Jesus came along and he showed them from the scriptures all the things concerning himself that should come to pass. And, and so here, Philip, he's going to open the scriptures and he's going to tell him and show him the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to show him, hey, you need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. He is the one who fulfilled this prophecy. He is the one who has fulfilled all the prophecies that, concerning Christ's coming uh, and suffering. And so here, Philip, he's going to preach unto him the Lord Jesus. And he, and we're going to see the result of this is that in verse 36, as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? He's going to ask a very fair question, a question that is one that we still ask when someone comes to present the, what he's going to uh, say, you know, what do I need to be baptized? And it's a fair question. This question is even applicable today. What does someone have to do to be baptized? Do, do, do we have to go to some special classes? Do we have to do some kind of good work? No, none of that's required, the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that it's simply, uh, here it says, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, Thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, just as this Ethiopian did, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, just as the man did, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This is a uh, exactly what this man did. He confessed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and, and upon his profession of faith, and this is often what we would say, you know, when someone comes for baptism, sometimes we even ask them, while, while in the up there, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? And that's exactly what Philip is doing here. He asks him, you know, uh, says, if thou believe with all thine heart, thou mayest. He answered, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He confessed that Jesus was the Son of God. So, upon that confession, then Philip is going to uh, allow him to be baptized. It says, And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. I was reading uh, uh, some commentaries just to make sure I'm not completely off my rocker and going off in some crazy direction. And they tried to say, you know, that this was some kind of sprinkling, that they went in ankle deep and dipped the water. And I'm going, well, if they did that, I mean, they're in the desert, and this is a man of great authority, of great importance. Certainly, he would have brought water to, while I was in the desert. I mean, he was reading out loud in the desert. I know I wouldn't be able to read for very long out loud in, the, in, a dry, in a dry climate without water. And so certainly he would have had water uh, with him, 
This would have been enough to drink, would have been enough to sprinkle if that's all that baptism was. But it's more than that. It's actually being immersed, just as we do it here. It was actually a going under and then a coming up. And so this is, uh, this is uh, why they had to uh, wait till they came to a body of water uh, large enough to do this. Uh, the eunuch here, he says, uh, he says talk, tell them he see is, here is water. Uh, and so when the, he asked him, you know, what do I got to do to be baptized? Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Philip then uh, baptizes him. And we see uh, at this point in time, even though it's fairly early in the church, it wasn't an uncommon thing. This is actually uh, what was recorded that they did there in Acts chapter 2. In verse 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were, they were added unto the church about 3,000 souls. So there was that ba- being baptized there even early on in the church there at Pentecost there, uh, just 50 days after the Passover, uh, shortly after the Lord Jesus Christ had ascended, uh, even then the church was still practicing baptism, just as the Lord commanded them to do, that, that they were to teach all nations and to baptize them. They were So here Philip is uh, fulfilling the scriptures in that way and that he's baptizing him. It says in verse 39, when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. So here they're going to be, he's going to be baptized, he's going to come up, and the Spirit of the Lord is going to catch him away, and, he's go- and the eunuch's going to go, I don't know where he's at. He's, he was right here, and now he's, he's gone. Uh, well, I guess I'll keep going here. And so that's exactly uh, what he did. They kept going. And uh, the, the Philip was then gone. Uh, and we're going to see that the eunuch went on his way rejoicing, rejoicing that he had found the Savior, that Jesus, that he had really, that he had accomplished his purpose for traveling to Jerusalem in the first place. Because he went to Jerusalem to worship that was the whole reason he had gone there. And yet, now he, on the way back, having accomplished what he believed, he came back, and this is where the, he met the Lord Jesus Christ, and his life was changed from that time that he had now the Lord Jesus Christ and had, the whole, had a greater understanding there. And so we see then, that he went on his way rejoicing. And we're going to read him here about Philip. And, but Philip was found at Aturas, this passing through. He preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And uh, can you guys put that map back up, please? So on the map here, this is the uh, kind of orange line down at the bottom by the seashore, by the Mediterranean. And that's the way that that's Gaza, that orange line there, uh, goes up to what uh, was formerly Ash, Ashdod. This is this um, Azotus. It would be the uh, pronunciation, Azotus. That's the same city, same spot. And that's where Philip was found. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till it came to Caesarea. So you're looking on the map, the green line going from along the seashore there, Going up, that's where Philip traveled, uh, but, and he preached. Some say he traveled by boat. We don't really know whether he walked or did it by boat. But we do know that, uh, that there in Caesarea uh, is where Philip uh, stayed, and we, uh, event, at, eventually, I don't know if he had it then or not, but he had a house there and had a family there. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 21, uh, in verse 8, it's talking about Paul and his company there. Those, those They were traveling. It says, And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. So we know that this man, uh, Philip, he was there, and he had 
a house there in Caesarea by Acts chapter 21. Now, whether we had it here or not, we don't know, but we do know that this is where he ended up. And, and this is uh, chapter 8 here, and this is talking once again about baptism. As I think about Philip, this man that was uh, one of the, the first deacons there and that was then later an evangelist, he, uh, he was obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ, even though sometimes it didn't make sense. I don't know why, you know, he probably didn't understand why he was leaving a great revival to go out to the desert. But he was still obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the spirit of the Lord leading. And so as we think about this, we come to a number of questions. Number one is, am I being obedient in what the Lord has called me to do? Have I or have I tried to think logically and think through man's reasoning to go, oh, you know, Lord, there's, there's a better way. Lord, there's, your way doesn't make sense. I know a better way. And yet, here Philip didn't say, there's a better way, there's other men. It would be easier. It would be more efficient. He just obeyed. And that's what Jesus wants from us is our obedience. He wants our obedience when it comes to the matter like this Ethiopian, when it comes to the matter of being baptized. If we believe that Jesus is Christ, is the Son of God, we can be baptized. Let's go ahead and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you, Lord, we do thank you. Lord, for the example of Philip, his obedience to you, even though Maybe he didn't understand, didn't know the outcome, and yet he obeyed. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be faithful to obey you, to obey, Lord, when you tell us to do things that maybe in our own minds don't make sense and we can't work out the logistics and it doesn't seem to work, and yet, Lord, you see so much more than we and you understand so much more than us. Lord, would you help us to be faithful, to walk in faith and in obedience to you. And Father, we do thank you for your, lo your love to us. Thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, we ask that as we dismiss from his place, Lord, that you would be with us, that we would be obedient unto you. And Lord, that if there are any here who don't know you as their Savior, Lord, that today would be their day of salvation, that they would see me or pass the word, Lord, that we could show them from your word how to, just as this Ethiopian was in need of you, Lord, how they can have their needs met in you. And Lord, we do love you, and we do ask these in Jesus' name. Amen.